Welcome back to Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth. It's been a little while since I looked at Aspire on this channel. In fact, we've gone through three revisions of Aspire since I actually previewed it. So today I want to talk about what's new in Aspire 9.1. Aspire 9.2 is on its way, should be out sometime soon after this video, but I won't be discussing any of its features, only 9.1, because there's quite a lot to cover. Let's get started. So here I am inside of an old project I have using Aspire. In fact, I have a host project here. And if we look at the host itself, we can see that I'm using not only the app host, but node.js to host a view project. I'm using RabbitMQ, Redis, as well as SQL Server. And I'd like to continue to be using these. But of course, this is 8.1. And what we want to actually bring in is an SDK aspire.apphost.sdk, and then version 9.1.0. And these come directly from the instructions on how to upgrade your project. Until recently, you had to actually use workloads in order to bring Aspire in because it's not being versioned with the runtime. And so we're bringing in 9.1, but notice that we do not need to update our .NET. It'll work with .NET 8, it'll work with .NET 9, and it will work with .NET 10, but is being versioned completely separately. And so the new way to do this is to include the Aspire app host SDK as an SDK for your project. I also want to update all of this stuff, all the Aspire dependencies, but I have some Aspire dependencies in some of these other projects. So I'm going to do it with packages for solution. And I'm going to look at all of the packages that I needed updated. And you can see we have quite a few here because we have the hosting ones, but in the client projects, I'm also using the non-hosting ones, the clients for these different pieces. Now I have a couple of other things that could be updated, but because of some versioning requirements right now, I'm not going to update anything but the Aspire packages. And we'll talk about why they don't have all the checking, but I've included all the Aspire ones. And you'll notice in some of these that the update is in more than one project like this one. You'll see that it's used there. So we come down here into the Rabbit client. I'm actually using it in a couple of projects and these updates for solution will allow me to update them all at once. Press the magic button, thoroughly read all of the licenses before I click OK. Evidently I did something bad here. I think when I upgraded it, it tried to add this line in here for me and got confused. So you may just want to update these versions and then this magic SDK line will come into the picture. And I'm using a preview and this bug right here is making me crazy, but they promise in the next preview it will go away. But you may see it come and go as we do our example here. Let's try to build that whole project. Now that we're using nine, let's take a look at the dashboard before we get into some of the nitty gritty. So this is a new dashboard and we can see a few things. Notice we say these are running unhealthy and that's because their health checks are failing because they're in sort of the startup mode. And so bringing up the database can take a little longer, especially the first time you do it. And now that everything's running, let's take a look at a few things that I find interesting. One is we can now see that we can have child resources. So in the case of the database, this running SQL server in a container, this is the database that we had specified. So it doesn't have any of its own source or endpoints, but we can see that if we had more databases, they'd all be under this value. We can also see, if I make this a little smaller, that they all, except for the shoe money database, all of these can be stopped and even restarted. So if I wanted to stop the cache to see what would happen in the system, I could do that or I could restart it. I can also go into, let's say the API and I can actually pick restart and that will just restart and get it going. And this can be useful if you want to affect a change that you found, or maybe you deleted a volume in a container. These are gonna let you not have to restart it every time. But we have a problem with what we've set up here. Let's go ahead and open our program.cs in the editor. We can see I have a queue, and this happens to be a rabbit MQ. I'm using Redis, SQL Server, and then I have some of my own projects, the API, order processing, and even the front end. One thing I will tell you that I I've run into, you want to be a little careful, is these should probably be kebab cased in lowercase because some ways you're going to be publishing them doesn't support uppercase. Just something to keep in mind. I'll actually be doing a video on deploying Azure in 9.1 to talk about some of those things I ran into. And so if we look at how this works, what we have a problem because if we go to the front end, we have our app 
but there's no database stuff in it. After we look at this, we're even getting errors because there are no products in the database. And that gives us a real issue here in that this has an implicit dependency on this because at startup, this attempts to see the database if it's a brand new installation. May not be the kind of issue you have every time, but it is one that can plague you. Luckily, Aspire 9.1 can help us with that. So let's go over to our API project and I'm gonna say, you know what? I want to wait for SQL. This is telling me that because I depend on it, I want to wait for the SQL to start up. In fact, I probably want to wait for all of these to start up. And I'll actually do the same thing for my other project. But of course, it only relies on the queue. So let's go ahead and run this. We can see that these are starting, but these are waiting because I told these to wait until the queue and the database are all ready. And so once the database gets installed, then we can start these. And so in this way, we can support how startup happens. We can really define define what is important for us to do startup on. So we start up again, we can see this whole process going and because we're starting a bunch of things, it can be slow to start up. And for development, this waiting is gonna be excruciating, waiting for all these different processes to start. Now they aren't that slow because they're caching the images for these different containers we're generating. For example, if we come and look at Docker Desktop, we can see that we have these four containers being generated. We have one for the cache, we have one for us to manage the cache if we want, we have the queue and the the database and those are all running and when we stop that project we can see that they're going to disappear they each take a little longer to shut down sql server is the slowest and there it's gone but what if we really wanted to do something that our development cycle may not require us to have a new order queue cache database or other resources and so what we can do here is actually say with lifetime and here we can give it a lifetime of persistent or session. Now session is what we've had the whole time. Session is saying that I want you to restart this each and every time. And for the pieces you're working on, that's great. But for pieces that don't need to be restarted, we can actually say persistent. And I'll actually add this to the cache and to SQL. And what this is gonna do, go ahead and run this. You're gonna see they're still starting up and this is still waiting for them, but they now have a thumbtack on them. And that's telling you that they are persistent. We don't have to restart the container if it already exists. If it doesn't exist, or if you wanna stop it here, those are all still available. But let's go ahead and run it one more time. You can see the cache commander started up a little slow, but all these were already running. And so these got to run really quickly. So that can really speed up your development cycle. And this is true of anything that is container-based. So if you're running a container that maybe is working with some stuff from another part of your company or some other third party, you can make them persistence as well because persistence is really about whether the container is stopped and restarted. And this can affect the order of the things you want to start up as well as the persistence on a deployed app as well. In some cases, you don't actually want to start one until you actually need it. And so again, to speed up development, let's say that in this case of the order processing, I don't actually want it to run every time we run it. So I'm going to say with explicit start. This is simply going to say, don't start this until I manually through the UI start it. And so if we look at our front end, that all continue to work because it actually doesn't rely on this order processing. In fact, let's go ahead and add a couple of orders so we can see how this will work. And so one other interesting thing here is that I want to show you the queue as well as start this in a minute. And now I can actually look at the details. These details will have things that are generated. In our case, I've actually hard-coded what the password and the username is for demos. But ordinarily, if you don't specify something like a password, you'd be able to grab it here by looking at what it is. And for me, it's just guest guest. So let's open up that queue. We could see here that we have queued messages. And if we look at the exchanges, we can see that we have the order and the order created exchange. We don't have the order completed exchange because that is actually in the project I haven't started. And here we can see we have two messages waiting in that order queue because no one has been there to pick it up. But if I go over here and start this explicitly, they disappear because my background processor actually processed them. And we can see this over here in that the queue went up and down. And then in the exchanges, we can see we now have an order saved queue because that's where the messages after they've been saved actually go to. 
So while we're in here, I do want to talk about a couple of other features, and then I have one interesting feature to show you at the end. One of the things I do like is that it's now localized. So as long as you're in one of these languages, which I'll have to tell you, Nederlands or Dutch is not included in here, it's something I'd like them to work on because I'm learning Dutch at the moment, but let's go ahead and say French, which I don't know either. But you'll see that resources and the headers over here all have been localized. Now the types and such, because they don't come from the dashboard, Board aren't actually localized, but we'll be able to see that console structure, traces, and even metrics, they're all going to be localized so that you can change it and use it based on what you want. I'm going to leave it at English because that's the one I understand most. We now have a quick way to pop over to the console as well. So let's say I want to go to my order processing and take a look at see what's been happening here. Here's the console for that. I can even stop it and start it from here so I can watch the console if I need. Of course, I can go back and look at consoles from any of these pieces. Let's talk about one other feature that's sort of a 9-1 feature and sort of not, because it's dependent on what you're actually using. So let's stop that. And I'm gonna open up the host and I'm gonna add a new NuGet package. And I'm gonna use one for service bus because that happens to be one of these resources that supports this. So I'm just gonna install it. One of the pain points has always been, let's go ahead and create a bus here by calling builder.add Azure service bus. I'm going to give it a name. I could add it here, but normally I would need to configure it for where I have a sample bus running up in the cloud, et cetera, or I'd need to run a emulator and figure out how to set those as properties here. But now we're gonna see a number of these that support emulators say run as emulator. And so what is this doing? It'll actually run a container that is an emulator so that you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. So if we run this, we can see the bus is starting and it started pretty quickly. And so if we look at the bus itself, let's look at those properties, can actually see that we're using a SQL password. That's what this bus SQL edge is. It's part of the emulation. We can see what it's using as those properties. And so then it can be like any other resource you're working with, except that during development time, you don't have to do any of the configuration. You can say, hey, I want a service bus. I'm gonna figure out how to configure it for Azure later when I'm ready to deploy. Or during development, I can pretend it's an Azure service bus, just like anything else. And you're gonna see this with a number of resources in Azure. Azure, but I suspect you're going to start to see this also in resources from AWS, from Google Cloud, etc. And so this allows you to really create a development environment that doesn't actually require each developer to have some temporary version of some services up in the cloud. You can really pretend that this is going to be developed like any other project. So where does that leave us? I'm a fan of how Aspire works. And if you're building anything that takes different building blocks in order to get an application working, I think this is great. Especially if you're using off the shelf components like RabbitMQ or any of the Azure services, being able to get up and running, run very quickly and go through that debug cycle is gonna be a real benefit. One of the things I like here is that knowing how to run this and then start working on your project means that other developers won't need to learn how to set up this host project. As long as the host project is part of what you check in, they should be able to set the current project to the host, press F5, and you're in business. I'll be talking more about deployment in an upcoming episode. So if you're interested in that, make sure and subscribe to the channel. Of course, a like would really, really help me. I'm going to be announcing something soon where you can actually help support the channel. I'm not going to be taking advertising, thought about it, but instead I have a different way that you can support me. Look forward to this in a couple of videos. My name is Sean Wildermuth. Thanks for joining me on Coding Shorts.